we're back. And joining us Hi, for James. this Q&A is Jim Cole. Welcome to the Bye. show. And you made it. Yeah, but yeah. can you hear me? You, we can hear you perfectly. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, great. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing fantastic. I am so excited. Um, people on the internet are super excited. And before I hand things over to Tony, I really have to read you this tweet from Mike Steven. It said, this is air this airing now is possibly my favorite all time story from any writer. I read this as a child and it has haunted me. I waited over 30 years to see this. Oh, is that so nice? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. If you can send that to me, that would be great. I'll screenshot it and I'll send it to you. Yeah, just send it to me on Facebook or wherever. Okay. The the echo here is a little creepy, but I'm getting used to it. Is I it you have your sound, sound on? I have the sound down. I'm hearing myself just in oh. the room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, take it away, anyway. Tony. Oh, okay. Yeah, where's Tony? Okay, there he is. There he is. James, first of all, we are in the room of greatness right now. I want the viewers Aww. out there to know that because you are the original OG you were in the beginning <laughs> of the Dollar Baby program, and yep. this is just a treat. Unbelievable. Uh, so I just want everyone to know that uh, right off the I bat. Really, I really appreciate that. Um, it, it's really amazing because they really were only, at least officially that we know of, the three Dollar Babies before me in 1982 and 83. And then there were none for four years. And then the same year, 1987, when I finished last rung, my dear friend James Gonis also finished The Lawnmower Man, which sadly is not in the festival this time, but maybe a future one because it's great. And, um, and this film has gotten, for a film that so few people have seen, this film's like legendary. And I don't say that out of ego. I say that out of how many people have talked to me through the years and said, oh my God, you made Last Ring on the Ladder? And I'm like, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very proud. And we I'm very proud. It. Uh, it is yeah. a great film. Um, let's go back. Let's go back to the 80s. So time you and I, we know each other for a very long time. I want to let the viewers know. Let's go back to the yeah. 80s that we love so much, James. Um, yes. Let's talk about what, uh, what was it like filming that Dollar Baby in with the, the technology and everything of the 80s era? I mean, uh, what was that like with the 8mm and everything? Well, the only other option we had is there was mini DV. It was just coming in. If you remember the little camcorders that had the little flip out screen. Yeah. And yeah. they, I just didn't want it shot on video. Video of that time just looked like video. And the most interesting comments I've heard from people that are only a lot of them just recent Facebook friends are, they say what's so great about super eight is that it, my movie looks like somebody's home movie from like the yes. 1970s. And that adds somehow to the effectiveness of th this particular story, that it's not, it's not totally professional. Um, we shot it over 11 days in the summer of 86. We found this barn and the owner just said, oh, yeah, go ahead, shoot. And we're like, okay, we will. <laughs> uh, and, and I had to be very, very careful because I was the oldest and I was responsible for the kids' safety. And uh, they were actually jumping. I don't mind revealing this. They were actually jumping on two mattresses that was covered with hay because mm -hmm. jumping even from six feet uh, into hay uh-uh, that's not going to work. They would have hit the floor. <laughs> so uh, they were never in any danger. And we were always, you know, I, if I was filming from the front, looking up at one of them about to jump, Dan was, you know, behind them to make sure they lost their balance. But we don't, we don't try to think about that. So the kids were amazing. Uh, Melissa was the, is the little sister of a friend of mine who helped out and uh, was in the movie Sponge. And uh, Adam Hulis, uh, I just knew through the junior, senior high school, uh, just a very, very nice, talented kid. And he just had so much fun doing the film. That's awesome. I love how you filmed the shots of, you know, making it look like they were like way up there at the top. And, 
you know, shooting it from the bottom angle like that. You want to go a little bit more detail of how you did that? Were you down on the floor or how? how uh, we would that? get as low, Dan and I, we get as low as possible. And Dan, I credit as director of photography, even though that's not in the credits of the film, because he is a brilliant writer and director living in LA now. And he couldn't be with us today because he has a, a standing Saturday shoot that he works on. Um, but really the way I had to create the illusion of them jumping from so high was through the editing, through how many frames of film I delay between the jump and then you see them hitting the hay. It really makes it feel like they're falling for about two seconds. Yeah. yeah. So that's how we <laughs> did that. The editing, the editing, especially once the ladder breaks, was one of the most important lessons in editing of my life to build the tension. <laughs> And and it was very difficult. It took a long time to make it work. So, and it came out. I don't mean to, I don't mean I don't mean to inter interrupt. I wanted to ask, uh, um, Leah, uh, did, was there any comment from the dairy? dairy uh, not of dairy, course, the there is. Library? These guys are I'm more sorry, organized than we are. So, <laughs> <laughs> this is your, this is from Dairy Public Radio Haiku Number Thirteen. Sibling bond unites. Second chances won't come twice. Ladder for a life. We give the last rung on the ladder. Five out of five. Blue chambray shirts. I'm thrilled. Thank you, library. Very excited. I love how much every filmmaker is looking forward to this. It's like their unofficial job that they just signed themselves up for, and it's fantastic. Oh, I know. Oh, I know. It's like, did I pass? <laughs> I don't think anyone's gotten anything lower than a five. So we're, you know, we're running strong right now. <laughs> I just want to, um, want to show you something before Anthony. Hold on a second. This no is the way. real thing. This is the original oh. film. This oh, is incredible. Wow. Yep. That shows you how, how tiny, how tiny and thin Super 8 film is. Oh, so that's great. That's, I still got it. That's you still so have all cool. these years. Oh, I'm not going to throw it away. Oh, Come on. No way. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> what, now, you brought up the location of the barn. Um, what about, I got to ask you, you said you filmed this in the summer. I used to live in the south, and I can tell you that barns in the summer are not very comfortable conditions oh, to be man. in because it's so we, hot. What was the temperature? Was, what was that condition? It, like? it, it, it got hot and humid. I mean, we don't get as terrible humidity on Cape Cod as you would down in the south, but inside a stifling old barn with no ventilation and us having to use handheld hot lights. We took a lot oh. of breaks, a lot of breaks outside. Luckily it was breezy. It was not, you know, like 90 or anything, but inside the barn, yeah, it had to be in the high nineties a lot of the time. So, and especially cause the kids were wearing those flannel shirts that I always just visualized in the story. Um, you know, they, they, they got to, Adam would unbutton his and kind of cool off in the outside. But no, we took a lot of breaks and, and we would have lunch and, oh my God, thank goodness there was an art gallery across the street that had a bathroom. <laughs> because there ain't no bathroom. There ain't no bathroom in that barn. <laughs> oh, Stay away man. from that part of the hay, kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, now you, you, you brought up the, the actors, so let's talk about them. What did they bring to the table in their audition that got them the role? And where did you find the kids? Did you go to local schools as a, as a scout no, them out or what? Well, I had said that, uh, Melissa is the little sister of my friend, Glenn from high school. And the minute that I had met her about the time I read the story, I knew if I ever did it, I mean, she had the part, she just was so her personality she wasn't i mean she was acting but that was just the way she really was she was just the sweetest kindest kid and had just so much fun and adam was just a he was actually quite shy he was a shy uh kid uh his parents owned a local motel and uh i just i just cast him we, we didn't really do any kind of casting things i just realized they were perfect we actually tried uh, and again if i go over time just let me know nope. we actually tried to start shooting it a year earlier in the summer of 85 and we hadn't even found a barn but we shot test footage about two rolls of super eight in the attic of the methodist church because it had the post and beam and we abandoned it because we knew that we needed a, a real barn and the kids were actually just a little too young at that time they were a little green 
Um, but I love that footage because they look so much smaller. And I've got to digitize that someday. You know, I'd love to put out the last strong bloopers because there's some really great, <laughs> great ones. Um, let's oh, and just to let, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. You go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, um, as I've written in my essay in your book, uh, Tony, uh, The Good and Bad of Film Adaptation, um, the most of it was shot on Cape Cod. The bedroom was my mom's bedroom in her 1730 um, uh, half Cape house, which is my brother's home in the summer now. But the exterior of the farmhouse, when you pan down from the sunset, and the barn, the big red barn that Larry looks at, is in the Berkshires 250 miles away. So I just, you know, you just edit together and that's how film works. Yeah. Um, let's talk about that beautiful score, the piano score. Who did oh, that? I love it. And, uh, tell us a little bit about that. That was just beautiful music. Ann Livermore uh, is a dear friend I'm still in touch with, and she was, uh, is a music prodigy, although she, she, she teaches. Um, and I asked her, could you compose an original score? I didn't have money, <laughs> money on this, this film <laughs> to, to pay the rights for any kind of music, and I couldn't even uh, picture any kind of music. And she came up with the main theme of course, your piano works so well to add to the tension when when Kitty is hanging. But my favorite part of the entire score is after Larry pulls Kitty out of the hay and you have that sunset shot that pans down to the farmhouse when Larry comes in to see her. Um, yeah. She basically, and, oh, excuse me, not that part. The part when you cut back to the present with older Larry. It's the same theme, but it's played in a minor key. And that's why it feels sad. That's why it works so well. And she it had to record that beautiful. score. It, she had to record that score in one hour. Well, that's all we could get at the University of Massachusetts concert hall. And I mean, imagine trying to play without any mistakes. And you're you're playing about ten minutes worth of music, and you got to get it all done in an hour. And she did it. So, um, oh, and she did I a love great that job. Score. It's yeah. beautiful. It really is. Yeah. Do you have any Twitter questions, Leah? I do. This one's coming to us from Donnie Kurtz, and um, they want to know if if Stephen King has ever watched this that you know of. I I believe he has. I never received any kind of acknowledgement. I mean, I just sent the film, and you know, it and they supposedly even back then he would put them on a shelf called Dollar Babies, and it was a VHS. But what was so exciting when Frank Darabont's Shawshank Redemption shooting script book was published in 1996 is that that was the first time King ever acknowledged and explained the dollar baby program. Wow. And when he listed some stories that had been filmed, he listed, of course, because he was setting up to talk about Frank Darabont, but he was mentioning others that had been filmed. And he mentioned Kane rose up, uh, you know, and uh, uh, the monkey and a couple others from from uh, Skeleton Crew. And then he said, uh, you know, I can't remember the other film, uh, one of the other stories that, that at that time had been made. But the fact that he listed Last Strong on the Ladder from Night Shift, that makes me hope that he's, he liked it. If he, if he took the time to list it, I have a feeling that means he at least enjoyed it. You I know, don't know, Mr. King, if you want to just tweet in here and, and let us know what you've washed off this <laughs> list. Yes. I mean, no, no, deserves it. we've already got no, no, a bunch no, no, of no, 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 I don't want him to we be, gotta on, entice I don't be on his shit list. We're not, we're not going to blame you. List. I can be on his shit list. I'm nobody. Like, okay. don't blame okay. the filmmakers. Blame these needy <laughs> event organizers. I, I. I will say this, it's, it's very scary to rewatch this movie all these years later, because all I see are the things that I couldn't do. And yet, it, seeing the wonderful scroll of comments right here on YouTube and Absolutely. answering some of them, but mostly seeing these kids' performances, I think that's what elevates the movie and really makes it work, because they are so believable as brother and sister. And I'm really proud of my direction of the kids. They were so easy to work with. And uh, I really think it's a nice little film. 
Um, did the kids at the time, sorry, sorry, Anthony, did the kids at the time when you made the film know who Stephen King was? Oh, sure. Okay. Oh yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that they had read him. Uh, Melissa was 11 and Adam was 13, but we had them read the story firsthand. And one of the main little tweaks I had to do to a story is as people know who know the story well, of course, the, the newspaper headline is call girl swan dives to her death. And out of deference to Melissa and her parents, <laughs> I didn't think that was particularly appropriate. So that's why I changed the headline to Young Girl, Swan Dies to Her Death. You know, that's, it's a low-budget project. It's not professional. So I didn't mind doing that. And I didn't have the budget to do, and that was something that this remake in 2011 did do uh, quite well, is they had some of the kitty scenes as an adult with her difficult life. And I just didn't have the budget to do it, do, do any of the adult stuff and hope that the letters would suffice. Awesome. Do you have time for one more question, Tony? Yeah, oh, I've got a, I've got a hundred questions for oh, James Tony? right now. But We've I got about three that. minutes. So pick your yeah. oh, most like, burning question. Okay. Oh, boy. Uh, okay. Um, the early years of the Dollar Baby program, because it started in 77, your film was in 87. Give us a, just a little quick retro of what that was like, because there was only like a handful of you guys, you and Frank and James and just like two or three others. What compared to today? It was not officially known. It was, uh, it was not even called that at that time. Even the Stephen King encyclopedia by Steve Spignesi, my brother and amazing mentor uh, for you too, Tony. He, uh, the two page write up he did on my film and the the lawnmower man didn't even say dollar babies. It just said student cinema focuses on Stephen King. Um, All I knew is I had read an article in Castle Rock, the Stephen King newsletter, wrote a letter to King, enclosed a check for $1. I never even got a contract or an answer. What I got was my canceled check in the mail with King's signature on the back. And that to me was go ahead and make the movie. So I did. And you still have that today? You still have that canceled check I do. today? I do. You do? But oh, the problem awesome. is I, I was displaying it. I know we got to wrap up. I was displaying it uh, in a little in a little frame. And I looked one day and saw that his signature was fading because it wasn't signed in permanent ink. So I had to mm. I had to put it away. So it's in storage somewhere. <laughs> but, but Leah and Anthony, I am so, so excited and so thrilled that the film has finally had a chance to be seen. Heck, worldwide. Worldwide, I mean, what that's a, right. What a dream. Worldwide. We're worldwide. so happy that and, you could be a part of it. It's been fantastic. Oh, I appreciate it so much. Oh, and Thank you're probably going to ask, and I know we got like 30 seconds. My dream project actually was uh, remaking Firestarter, but since that's already in the works, I'm crossing my fingers that it will be good. I don't dislike yeah. the 1984 film. I think Drew Barrymore did a very good job, but I thought it it just didn't have any of the King flavor, and I really was disappointed in it. So I hope they do that much, much better. And I can't wait for Desperation, not Desperation, The Institute, the miniseries. Yes. That I'm yes. really excited about. Awesome. So, yeah. Thank you so much for being here. We're going to introduce oh, the next you, film. You thank you, you Jerry, you yourself. Jay. My buddy Jay, go the for it. One. Thanks, everyone. Bye. The great one, buddy. I love you, brother. <laughs> Good night. Thanks, Tony. Okay. Thanks, Leah.